Hello, everyone. I'm Richard Fredrickson. Once again, the privilege and pleasure of being out here at Lewis University Airport uh, for this is my second time doing this. What a privilege it is. It's the EAA uh, Squadron B-17 flight for veterans here at Lewis University Airport. And I have a one of many special guests who I have the privilege of talking to today. He drove all the way from Schaumburg, Illinois, and I'm talking with Emil Prabola. Is that how you pronounce your last name? Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. Huh? Well, uh, first, before we talk about World War II and what you did there, because you're using a word that I'm not familiar with, because we, uh, the, the fellows I talked to last year never used this word. I know what you do, but I bet you don't. And we're going to let you, uh, I'll tell you what. What, tell them what you don't tell them what you did. Just tell them what it's called, and then I'm going to talk to you, and then you can try, see if you can guess what he did on the plane. What did he call it? It was called a tagalier. Okay, tagalier. Now, while they're thinking about and wondering what that is, let me ask you this: World War II. When did you and why were you drafted, or did you join? I was drafted in January of '43. 1943. But I, I was going to volunteer back in October 42. Uh, some of the fellows from the office were going to the Chicago University and uh, getting trained as in the medical corps. And it sounded good to me. And a captain convinced me that I should join. I went back to the office and the boss pulled out his hair and he says, no, you can't leave me. He says, Warren's gone, Don's gone, and you're going to go. So he talked me out of it. So you stay here and take care of work. Right. 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 At that time, I worked for a coffee company, mm -hmm. and they were rationing coffee. So, oh, yeah. so there was quite a shortage of coffee and a lot of extra work connected with it. And was this downtown Chicago? Downtown Chicago. Yeah. In, yeah. How old were you? I was, uh, eight, well, 18 at the time, 19. Uh, 18, 19 years old. That's about the average age of most of the fellows going in. I was 20 when I was drafted. Yeah. So you're an old man at 20. Right. <laughs> and now you're a young man. It's amazing, uh, this really, gentleman. Really, our pilot, when we got to England, was 25 years old, and we called him Pappy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what's what's so interesting uh, when we took the B-17 flight last year I didn't realize that most of the crew members are about your height a little bigger a little smaller correct I was 125 pounds yeah. I trained in a ball turret oh my so, goodness so I was I was just perfect for the ball turret yeah. Now let the folks know what, what a Tangalier is. Well, the Tangalier flies in the nose of the plane and uh, actually drop the bombs. But in the squadron, there's 12 planes. Uh, and the lead ship and the deputy lead ship have commissioned bombardiers that sight the target. And when they drop the bombs, they drop a smoke bomb. And when the rest of the, the fellows in the squadron see that smoke bomb, they hit that toggle switch. That's why they call us toggle ears. Yeah. We drop the bombs. Yeah. And you know, in all the John Wayne movies I ever watched, you never saw the smoke bomb go down. They just, in the dead of night, they could just hit that target Hollywood style without any... any anyone in that lead plane showing them where the target was. Wasn't it amazing? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and untrue, untrue. The, uh, uh, how many missions were you involved in? I only flew 15 because I developed pneumonia, ended up in a hospital for 35 days. Yeah, so. But 15, I mean, what is he, there's not much more than that, the average missions, is there? It started with uh, 30, 30 missions, and then it they dropped it to 25 yeah. for a tour. Yeah. But I, I know of individuals that signed up for a second tour. Yeah. Well, those are, those, are the, those are the patriots and heroes that we're talking to today. Uh, where'd you fly out of, uh, England? Uh, Pottington in England. Mm -hmm. Just, it was a, f a farm 
that was camouflaged. And uh, it was northwest of uh, London, about 65 miles. How were the um, uh, folks living in that area? Were you accepted pretty much by the Brits? Oh, yeah. In fact, after the war, uh, we still have people that uh, are associated with our the 92nd Bomb Group. We still have reunions. Well, go over there. Pardon? And you go over there for those reunions? They did on two occasions, but normally we meet every two years. Oh, here? Right. In the States? In the States. Yeah. They go from city to city. Good. Great. You know, I, I don't know if you can catch this on that camera, but I, this man was on an honor flight, and I want to let folks know what that is about because I've had the opportunity to witness that and share a little bit of your experiences and tell the folks what an honor flight out of Chicago is like. I'll never forget the date. It was June 7th, 2011. It was such an occasion. It starts with uh, a flight out of Midway Airport. You have to be there at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, maybe I should tell you that uh, how it started. I understand that uh, uh, it was started by a woman. I don't recall her name. But her father never got to see the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. He died. And she started this organization to give veterans the opportunity to see the memorial. And I was on the 28th flight out of Chicago. I think they're up to 50 now. And uh, you have, you're at Midway at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they take your photograph, and uh, they assign a guardian for you. Yeah. They have a guardian for every three people on the, on the plane. But once you get to Washington, D.C., they assign a guardian individually and uh, I'd say 60 percent of the veterans were in wheelchairs. Yeah. The guardians are military, correct? Not necessarily. Not, no. I had a, a young redhead. <laughs> I, I take it that was, she was a female redhead. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, very pleasant person. And she kept asking me, you sure you don't want a wheelchair? You sure you don't want a wheelchair? But she was assigned to us the whole time that we were there. And uh, it's strictly volunteer yeah. on their part. When we got off the plane, we were uh, greeted by the military, saluting us as we got off the plane. And we got to see the World War II Memorial. They had an honor guard for us. And uh, there was a woman that started singing the Stars to Bangle Banner. Of course, all the veterans joined in, and they played taps, which was... Pretty emotional, I Yes, imagine. yes, yeah. Yeah, very touching. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. We got to see the other memorials, too, the Vietnam, the Korean, yeah. and the Lincoln Memorial. It's really a, a phenomenal day for you, but I would also say it's probably a, a stretch. I mean, it's a huge, it's, you're at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning probably to get there, and then it doesn't end until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Uh, I was the last one to get off the plane. I was in the very rear of the plane, and they have all the ones with wheelchairs up in the front, so it took a good half hour to unload the plane. And... Uh, People that knew me kept thinking, well, there's Emil, there's Emil. <laughs> they see a gray hair, you know. They, a few gray they, hairs they, there. <laughs> they thought it was me, but uh, I was one of the last ones. Yeah. But they had the uh, firemen and the policemen, drum and bugle corps, uh, welcoming us. Now you had the, um, uh, uh, the guys in the kilts, <laughs> the... the um, I was there in 2011. Bagpipers, thank you. That's the one I was at. Yeah, I yeah. probably saw you. There were like 2,000 yeah. people at Midway yeah. greeting us. It was a phenomenal experience. And uh, I swear that all of Great Lakes was there to salute us yeah. when we got off the plane. All those young recruits. Isn't it amazing how young they looked? <laughs> they were like 14-year-old kids, but obviously they were not.
but the uh, children put out their hands yeah. and greeted us yeah. and thanked us. It was really touching. It, uh, it's an experience that uh, if you know of anyone who is in a World War II veteran who hasn't been on an honor flight, uh, somehow, some way, we'll get the information up there on the, on the screen before we're finished here. Okay, sir, thank you for your service. And uh, you know, I should ask how how do you keep so young? What, you eat oatmeal every day or something? What what do you do to keep so young? Well, my wife took good care of me. Uh, she passed away a year ago, and um, I've been exercising right along. Uh, when my mother died, they thought she, she had hardening of the arteries, mm -hmm. which actually is uh, Alzheimer's. Yeah. And uh, that they thought it was hardening of the arteries, and I thought, hardening the arteries, but that could be hereditary, so I started exercising. That was back in 1970. And uh, been exercising ever since. Well, it worked. And I've joined the um, uh, community um, recreation. In, in Schaumburg? In Schaumburg. Good. So I go there three days a week and work on the machines. Great. Well, again, thank you so much, uh, Emil uh, Prabola. Is that how you pronounce it? You get the, the name correctly Pr pronounced? Pribula. Pribula. Everybody called me Prib. Okay. Prib, again, thank you so much for your service and for being here today. And hopefully you get on that flight. I see the captain just to the right of us here, and he's got your name down on the, on the flight plan to go up. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bring back some good old memories. Yeah, uh, one piece of flak came up through the this panel here. Just missed my knee. Oh no. And one just missed my head up here. And I had my hand on the switch. The salvo switch. Here. And one just came up through the panel. Oh. Piece like that. That was the one mission. Gee. Yeah, that was the one you'd like to forget. Yeah, we had to circle the uh, airfield three times. They had a smoke screen set up so the bombardier couldn't pick out the target. Wow. So we had to keep circling. And the whole time, they're shooting a flak at us. Oh, no. I don't know how you guys did it, I'll tell you. Yeah. I don't know. Got you guys must have had. Shit. Unreal. Well, we were young. You were? Yeah, that helped. <laughs> that helped, didn't it? 20 years old, you know. Nothing's going to happen. No. I'm, I'll live forever. We're going to continue our uh, interviews with our uh, patriots and our heroes and um, uh, the memories and some stories uh, coming your way. I, I have a gentleman who's from Joliet, Illinois. Uh, I think Lewis, well, actually, this is not Joliet. I, what is it, Romeoville we're in? I think Romeoville, but just on the other side of that wall is uh, Joliet. And I have Edward Vercelli. Uh, Edward, first of all, thank you for coming and thank allowing me to here. talk to you. Um, by the hat you're wearing, your Army Air Corps? That's correct. Right from high school. Right from high school. Did you, you joined up at high school? <clears throat> no, I joined before I got out of high school. Oh. And after I got out, it was just a matter of a couple of months till I was old enough and I was gone. Now, the mom and dad know about this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah dad was in World War I. He enlisted. I enlisted here. My brother enlisted in the Navy, left college when they, things started over there. My younger brother, he enlisted. We just figured to owe the country something. Yeah. Yeah, those are uh, those were special days and special men and women uh, serving their country in World War II. The uh, Army Air Corps, which is now uh, the U.S. Air Force, uh, were you... I can't believe that you had a choice. Did they tell you you're going to be in the Army Air Corps, or did you have a choice between infantry? Or? I enlisted into the uh, 
Air Force to start with, the yeah. Army Air Corps. Yeah. And when they called me, that's where they sent me to basic, and that's where I stayed. Where was basic? Miami Beach in July. Well, that's wonderful, because in those days, there was no air conditioning, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> You're telling me. I'll bet you there were some stories, uh, uh, perhaps, of adult beverages being consumed uh, before and after uh, training. The what? Do you have any beer down there in Miami? No. No beer. Okay. We'll, we'll stick to that story. Um, one of the things I see in my notes here uh, is that you are both a navigator and a pilot. Correct. And I remember that from last year. I always thought you are either a pilot or you're a navigator. Why both? <clears throat> well, you took all these psychomotor tests, and they decided if you was going to be a navigator, bombardier, or pilot, and I put in for pilot, and at that time, they had a shortage of navigators and an overage of pilots, so off to Hondo, Texas. And then uh, <clears throat> af after the war and after a few years with the weather squadron, I go went ahead and reapplied to be a pilot, and I went through school then. So when you're first in the Army Air Corps, what year is that? Uh, that would have been in 43. Okay, and then you're reapplying, then it's after the war? Yeah, well, after the war, I flew with weather reconnaissance for a few years, okay. flying the hurricanes and all this kind oh of goodness. stuff. And then uh, I did, I put in my... Uh, request pilot school yeah. and I got it and then uh, in 49 I went through pilot training flew another 5,000 hours before I got out so I had I don't know something over 7,000 hours between the two now a navigator in 1943 1944 1945 share with the folks out there what you know you didn't have all the electronics that they have today Okay, you didn't have all the instrumentation and electronics that they had today. Yeah. How did you navigate? How, did you look through a window or something? With the stars, and pilotage, and radio, that's all we had. Yeah. And if you, if you were in the lead plane, you had to be right on target. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, f I flew some lead, but I went over there with a the crew, and uh, then as the troops were moving forward over there on – so they wanted to get this GH business down, and they sent me down to an RAF base down around, uh, well, close to London, and I spent, I don't know, about three weeks down there, and then when I came back, I went with the lead crews, and uh, it wasn't too long before the war was over. Yeah. How many missions? Well, all together, probably, uh, probably not more than 20 missions, but I did a lot of... <laughs> A lot of work in the meantime. I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Any um, any one particular story you'd like to share? Well, the only thing is, uh, back then they had uh, no real system for the weather to mount anything, and I I <clears throat> volunteered to go into that instead of coming back to the states, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time there it was Newfoundland, and uh, later on they moved to Bermuda. But we did all uh, the weather recon out over the ocean, up over the North Pole. When the Pakistan Dream Broke flew, we had to go up there and do all his weather for about six weeks. That was the guy that was uh, dramatized in polar flight. You fly many more miles, but you get there quicker. Yeah. And... Uh, we got all of his weather, but uh, <clears throat> I spent some time after that with Mats, just flying back and forth to Germany. Was in on a Berlin airlift. What is Match? Huh? What is Match? Oh, the military air transport. Sorry, and uh, let's see. I lost well, me. let me ask you this: Which did you like best, Newfoundland or Bermuda? Well, <clears throat> it really didn't make a bit of difference, to tell you the truth. In Bermuda, we could take off in the dark in the morning and fly nothing but uh, patterns over the ocean, come back and land at night. And uh, when, during hurricane season, it got a little more interesting. I'll bet. Yeah. 
but uh, I didn't have really any any f favorites. Just yeah. moving around wherever they needed me. So after uh, after you've you've finished with the Weather Service and the, and the Army Air Corps, what did you do? Uh, what have you been What have you been up to since uh, 1946? 1946. I was still in there. 1940. Let's say 1950. Did you go back to Joliet? Uh, no, I was still in there in 1950. In fact, I just got out of pilot school. Well, how many years were you in the Army Air Corps? Uh, I had uh, 21 years. Okay. Yeah, I retired from there. All right. In fact, uh, I put in an application out here at uh, when I got out, and I put one in at APS at the Army, and that one came through first, so I went with them. You had a lot of years with the military, my friend. Yeah, yeah. 21 and then working with them all yeah. along, yeah. Down at Apps and then we moved to Rock Island and uh, dealt with the uh, maintenance of all ammunition, chemical, yeah. biological, nuclear, the whole thing. So. Well, I want to thank you for your service. Now, before we're finished here, though, because you had a driver and an assistant and a supporter who brought you here today. And uh, she's behind the cameras right now, and we want to just recognize her. Who is that, who is that woman over there? Uh, that's my number one daughter, born in uh, Houston, Texas. And number two daughter, born in New York. This one spent four years over in Japan. Took kindergarten. In fact, she's going over there next week. See if she can find her old kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she can. I'm sure she can. What's her name? Huh? What's your number one? Uh, uh, number one in 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 chronological order. That is. What's her name? Oh, Anita. Anita okay. Marie. All right, Anita Marie. Thank you so much for bringing uh, uh, Dad here today. And uh, enjoy yourself in Joliet. Uh, great city. Wonderful people. And the great thing about Joliet is the, are the people and people like you. Thank you for your service. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. you here with uh, this gentleman here, uh, Bill Hefflinger. Is that how you pronounce your name? Hefflinger. Hefflinger. He should know how to pronounce his name. Uh, most of the time I forget it myself. Don't Bill, feel bad. Bill was a pilot and um, a B-17 pilot? Yes. Yeah. And when was that? What year was that? Well, let's see. When was World War II? You're right around 1941. Well, I didn't, I didn't wasn't flying then. I was still flying. 42, 43? I was flying in combat in 44, 45. Okay. All right. The, uh, uh, now, I'm told that as you recollect these, uh, these years that you have, uh, you have one story that you'd like to tell? Do you have a story? Or you want to keep that a secret? Sitting there. I know, I know. We'll we'll keep it kind of keep it clean. Well, there goes the story. Oh, there goes the story. <laughs> where are you from, sir? Pardon? Where Where do you live? In Chicago. No. In Chicago, in Chicago's oh, yeah. suburb of Crest Hill, Illinois. Crest Hill. I, that's what my notes tell me right here. I, yeah. Well, if I forget where I live at the. Uh, and you lived there a long time. Oh, year. Oh, okay. So. All right, so three years in, in, in Crest Hill. You live in, by the family then with the... He lived in Chicago for three years. Oh, okay, so a good Chicagoan. Moved to Crest Hill in the Falls. Yeah, all right. So, uh, uh, Bill, um, as a, uh, were you a pilot and a navigator or, or strictly a pilot? A pilot. Okay. How many missions? 29 completed, two aborts, and one mechanical something or other, whatever you call it, uh -huh. didn't work. Didn't work out, but uh, so the, the two aborts, one mechanical problem, but you had tw no, over 20 missions? No, no, they canceled for some reason or other. The mission was canceled after the aircraft got off the ground. So we had to come back then and land with a full bomb load on board. Wow. Rather than drop in the channel. Yeah. So you're flying out of England, Britain? Yes. And, and uh, during, during that time as a uh, pilot, um, did you keep the same guys? Were the same guys with you for all these different missions, or do you have different uh, crews? 
You mean personnel on each crew? Yes. Yes, basically the same crew members each day. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a guy might be missing, but basically the same guys we started with in Florida until we finished over there in England. That's really interesting. So you, you guys uh, trained in Florida, then went to uh, Great Britain, and you stayed together. Yes, as a crew, yes. Yeah. And we did not call as a replacement personnel, excuse me, uh, we went out as a trained crew. Yeah, great, very good. So we had the guys from Milwaukee, uh, Texas, uh, New York, Chicago, of course, John and I. Uh, I know where Sanford came from, but old Bubble Butt came from <laughs> East Coast or somewhere. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You must have great – are you looking forward to the uh, flight today? Very much so. Have you been on the B-17 after you uh, left the service? No, I haven't, seen, I haven't been near one. Well, that's going to be a great – You can go out to the uh, air, air, air show at Kenosha whenever they hold that. Mm -hmm. No, I've never been there for that. Well, you're going to have a great day today, and I want to thank you for your service. Thank you so much for uh, being here today, and uh, thanks to your daughter for uh, bringing uh, you here today as well. You look great, uh, and the, the best of luck to you. She was in 41 years. Did you hear what you said? 40. I look great. Not anyone else. Just I look great. And you do. And you do. <laughs> look over there at the teleprompter. It says... For four years? 41. Oh, I went in at 41. No, you went in. 41 years 41 in the... 41 years. Oh I guess it was 41 years. Uh, oh, my goodness. I, I see. Yeah. I don't forget, I was a very, very young man. Well, sure. <laughs> sure. And, and still and, a... And keep my thing in mind, I lie like hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, I'm going to close it out with just asking you about the, the, the war itself. What do you think? What do you What's think? What's your recollection? What's that? Your, the, your memory of the war. Which war? World War II, the one that you, the first one you fought in. What about it? How many years were you involved in that one? If you had 41 years, how many years? I say December 12, 41, Christmas Day, 45, and back off into the reserve for a little bit, and back into the flying reserve out of O'Hare, and recalled for the Korean War. Oh, you were in the Korean War, too. Yes. Yeah. And I was flying B-25s. But not know. a B-24. No, 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 no. I want to make sure you didn't hit me after I said a B-24. Oh, no, no, my, 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 my condolences always go out to the B-24 jocks. Yeah. It was noisy. It was shaky. It was faster. It flew faster than the B-17. Uh, it carried a heavier bomb load than the B-17, but it couldn't take the physical punishment of the equipment vehicle. Yeah. I mean, uh, the B-17 take a hell of a lot of punishment. The B-24 couldn't do that. Bill, thank you so much. It was great, a pleasure, and a privilege meeting you. We continue with our interviews uh, with Maury Renke, and uh, I remember you from last year, sir. It was good talking with you then. It's even better talking with you today. You uh, and you have help, uh, and and your daughter brought you here today. What's her name? Janet. Okay, very good. And Shannon, she's going to hold up the cue cards for us so that we get the conversation <laughs> just right. Uh, if I recall, you were a pilot, but I don't recall what equipment you were a pilot on. It was on a Baker 1-7 uh, Flying Fortress, and you want the dates? Sure. <laughs> well, I started training in it uh, uh, in late February of uh, 1944, and... Uh, I trained uh, and learned how to fly in Hobbs, New Mexico, on the B-17. And uh, we were there about nine weeks, I think. Then uh, they sent us up to Lincoln, Nebraska, and they crewed us up with 
uh, people for all uh, eight other positions, or nine other, I suppose I should say. And uh, then they sent that makeup crew with a whole bunch of others to Sioux City, Iowa, and we trained there for 12 weeks, seven days a week, because they were trying to pound the, the heck out of Hitler because they were, they were making some gains. So they, they made sure they kept the heavy bombers in his, his hair, I guess that's what their yeah. thing was. Anyway, uh, so... How many crew was, members in, that, in the Flying Fortress? How many crew members? Well, there's uh, 10. You got the pilot, co-pilot, and uh, his officers, and then also a bombardier and a navigator. That's four officers, and there's six enlisted men. The most important one, in my opinion, is the aerial engineer, and I think I had the best one in the Air Force, so I was lucky in that respect. An aerial engineer, is that like a navigator? No. No? He's uh, the guy that does everything, fixes everything, runs the top turret between the pilot and the co-pilot. He knows more about the engines than some of the pilots, even. And he, he was just... He's one of those natural mechanics, you know. You run into some people, and mechanics come, and he was like that. The only thing he had was a kind of a bad attitude. He wouldn't even, he, he never called me sir. He never uh, called me, or I shouldn't say never, but rarely called me lieutenant. He'd just call me Ranky all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he was from Brooklyn, though. Oh, so I, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but he, in my opinion, he knew more about that airplane, and he told off more captains that I had to placate when they stuck in their nose in his business. Because I even heard him tell one captain, you're not talking to me. If you want to talk to me, you talk through him. Plenty pointed yeah, to me. Right. I said, I don't know. What I never did find out what the heck they were arguing about, but he was a nice man. Yeah. Then the other ones were mostly gunners, you know, tail gunner, a ball turret gunner, and two waist gunners. Yeah, so that was kind of a gimme. Yeah. It was a flying fortress in those days the largest aircraft and the most powerful aircraft that we had at that time? Uh, well, I guess you could argue the point here and there. Uh, I don't really know. I, I, it was by far the most plentiful one we had because it, it, it was based in the very early 1930s when it was designed and the first of them were built. And as you know, on Pearl Harbor Day, there were some damaged and one shot down by the Japanese coming in there to surprise us. And we did have them there, and there was a group of about uh, 35 or 40, if I remember correctly, in the Philippines that ended up getting captured or blowing up mm -hmm. shortly after they invaded the Philippines. So uh, I guess you could say it was the heaviest uh, bombardment aircraft that we had. Now, were you involved in, uh, in the European missions, and if... If so, how many missions were you involved in? Uh, well, yeah, uh, after my training, we were sent to England to and signed to the 15th, uh, the 8th Air Force, and delivered. I flew a new airplane all the way over there, and I was there six days, and all of a sudden, they took about 12 crews and put them on a couple of uh, converted uh I can't say the name of the other plane. It, it's that big four-engine four, four uh, engine one. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. <laughs> the competition with it. But anyway, uh, that's the one that uh, uh, we flew, the, the 17. And what was the question? I forgot. Well, I was just asking you how many missions were you flying. Oh, well, uh, everybody's supposed to fly at that time at 35. Earlier in the war, it was 25 missions, and they would rotate you out. It was up at 35 when I was there. And you flew your 35 missions, and nothing happened to you. They rotate you home. 
So anyway, I ended up, I did, but before I started those, they transferred me down to Italy because of the huge losses, the 15th Air Force uh, uh, gave up when uh, we were bound them in the hell out of uh, the Ploesti oil fields and trying to get that thing out so Hitler couldn't get any uh, fuel oil mm -hmm. from it. And so uh, that's... Uh, it was really important, wasn't it? Because uh, history teaches us, in, in retrospect, that the uh, German uh, army, the land, uh, they were constantly, at times, running out of fuel. And, and without fuel, the army goes nowhere. That, that was the, the idea on why they were surrendering so much of the yeah. uh, Air Force to that. Uh, the Ploesti fields were far and away the biggest source of petroleum fuels for Germany and they had a couple of really big plants and they, they were making uh, imitation fuel I think out of coal I'm not I didn't even ask questions but there was one they rated the toughest target in Germany when I was there it was called Brux it was in a part of an old Czechoslovakia about 80 to 100 miles south and a little bit west of Berlin and uh, then they had another one in a place called Blechhammer, which was uh, a little farther south, but much farther east. And it was just about dead south from Breslau in Poland. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, that was a much tougher target than Brooks. But they didn't pay me to <laughs> get that. <laughs> you just followed orders. Welcome to their, yeah. I, I mean, if they told me you got to hit one place three times, take your choice. I would have been to Brux three times before I had even thought about going to Blechhammer. Because that one, no matter what we did, we always got hit hard there. And then they had, I guess all the, the guys that trained the gunners had retired and they were living there making their living. I don't know. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Well, I thank you, sir, for your service. And uh, uh, hopefully you get a chance to get up and, and uh, fly today. I see your hat. You're on her flight. And I know that's a great uh, experience for you as well. And uh, Romeoville is the hometown of Maury Renke. And again, thank you so much. Well, I'm going to welcome you back, uh, Joe. It's good to see you again. Well, it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, first of all, before we begin, um, this gentleman just a little while ago got married. Is that true? That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, congratulations. Your wife's name? Thank you, Marion. My wife's name is Mercedes. All right, Mercedes. And you'll be watching uh, this interview. We'll do it. Uh, and then you have your assistant and, and producer here, Anita, your daughter? That's my daughter. <laughs> okay. She's the executive producer of this, of this particular session. Uh, what, and I know these, but I'm going to ask you these questions anyway. What were you doing uh, on the, on the B-17? Well, as I said, I flew three different positions while I was there. I flew eight missions as a waste gunner, 24 missions as a ball turret gunner, and three missions as a tail gunner. Wow, that's fun. And completed my 35 missions. <laughs> Got your 35 missions. So you were in toward the end of the war because that's when they changed it from 25 to 35? That's right. They changed uh, from 10 uh, gunners to nine. Yeah. yeah. And as a result, we had to um, wiggle around in order to make the 35 missions wherever we could. Yeah. There's a flight taking off here in about five or six minutes from Lewis University Air Airport with a B-17. Uh, did you fly just the B-17s? That's right, yes. Yeah. Now, training where, Texas? I trained at about a half a dozen different places before I went overseas down there. But my biggest training was at uh, Buckley Field in uh, Denver, Colorado, where we went through the whole uh, mm -hmm. system of the ball turret. Uh, and it was an armament gunner, which would... Uh, deal with uh, ammunition and uh, the bombing, the bombs and everything else down there, and take the machine gun apart and put it back together again, yeah, and, and how, all those sort of things. And how old were you in those days? I was 19 years old at that time. Yeah, it's phenomenal. <laughs> it just, it, isn't it phenomenal when you think these guys were 18, 19, 20 years old, and three different positions, and flying, and navigator, and bombardier, and all of these uh, positions uh, back in the days. Uh, Missions flowing, uh, 35, were those out of Great Britain? It was out of uh, Britain over uh, Germany. Yeah. All 35 missions were over Germany. And uh, where are you residing now? Where, where are you living at? 
That was at uh, Sylvester Field, the 305th Mom Group oh. in Sylvester, England. Okay. And now in Lockport? That's right. Okay. Lockport, <laughs> home again. you'd be proud of this man, and uh, we're proud of your service to your country, and we're proud that you're back here again and at the Chicagoland B-17 uh, Flying Fortress is on his shirt there. <laughs> How about that? Thanks so much. Thank you. Very Take good, care. Man. Thank you. You know what? That plane didn't look so big when it was across the street. It looks pretty big when you're up there. Yeah. 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 It was big for a bad yeah. day. Yeah. 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 We came out with the beach when he... Their way across the country. Three and a half percent of them. That's fine. Wherever you can get the best shot. Emily's coming back, huh? Just stand right on the What? Poke your head in. Yeah, don't go in. carry people on board the airplane. The emergency ex exits on the airplane are the main door that we're going to enter into there back there where the steps are. And just to the left of there underneath the tail, there's a small door that's a uh, tail gunner's uh, bailout access door. Up over this, over, right over the mid wing there is an open hatchway, has a lattice, lattice work uh, cover over it. We can take that out and go over the top of the fuselage. We can open up the bomb bay doors. If we can put through the, through the pilot's windows, we can go out through there. <laughs> and uh, over on the other side of the nose here, by the nose arc, there's a small door there. And in the TV program movie, 12 o'clock high, you would see them open that door, throw the gear up in there, jump up and grab the top of the door and swing on into the airplane. And that is where the board crew members did get on board. We don't do that too often anymore. <laughs> so, wasn't any problem when they were 20 years old. <laughs> As you're sitting down, just before, uh, just after takeoff, look forward. I'll be on the flight deck, and I'll give you a thumbs up. That uh, means it's okay to unbuckle your seatbelt and get up and move around. Take pictures out the side windows or whatever come up into the nose section. Due to space limitations, you know, two people at a time up in the nose and two people up in the flight deck. You get up in the nose section because there's eight or so other people that want to do the same thing. There cannot be anybody up there for landings or takeoff. Just before landing, I'll give you a set down signal. Just sit down as close as possible to see. It doesn't make any difference if it's with the seat you're in before or not. That way we can let you stay up and take, take a picture. It's very narrow. Watch out for cell phones and cameras. If they fall down on the bomb bay doors, you have to wait till we get on the ground and open them up and retrieve them. The bomb bay doors will not support anybody standing on them. How much? The, the what? The bomb bay doors? Yeah. Most of them, a lot of them are made to sort of break away at a certain weight. We, we, we had a fellow caught, fell, fell the instructor says, no, no, the door, I didn't got it, this airplane has these doors that hold 160 pounds. And how do you know? I was on the damn doors before with no briefing. That's right. Yeah, I told me, go down, <laughs> in there, pilot, go, and the bombs came off. The, the 
hangers there, mm -hmm. and one of them actually went through the side and it was half in and half out. Is that he didn't know what was going to happen, yeah. so we turned around and went back over the ocean because we couldn't land like, that way, mm -hmm. and we dumped them in the ocean and then uh, had, to, had to come back that way. And we, they got the doors closed manually, but yeah. put the hole in there. Yeah. I think they've been dead for years. Here's the title. Okay. So I'm sitting up in the front. There's beautiful pictures of them sitting in the seat. Yeah, in the radio. And he said, the switches were right where I left them.
yeah. Chin yourself in, in the there, service, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You didn't go this way, Joe. Right. Yeah, we had, all the guys uh, yeah, that worked up there. Yeah, we all went. Oh, watch yourself. Hey, Bill. Made it again, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, number 26. Hey, <laughs> yeah. yeah. we got it. Great. Put that you in your log book. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we went right down log 60. You might need assistance to pull an up and stop it. Radio operator wants you to fix that radio. Yeah, it's not working. Not a problem. We'll get rid of it. Yeah, under, under wrong channel. Somebody's struck. Okay, we've got people. Come, we got people coming out here. There he goes. Just, are you pretty good at this? We're gonna be doing half of this. Yeah. Just kind of. Just like that. All the way down with this right foot, Dad. All the way to the ground. Come on. All the way. One more. Down. All right, sir. Land. You can go straight up. Right. Your land. Right You're on the ground. You're on the ground. The eagle <laughs> has landed. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, that was. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I take that as not exactly complimentary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lost the band. I still didn't get a look at the father. Oh. Sorry. Oh, you, you can come back next year. Plan. You need to start working out a little. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Tell them where you need a little, a little aerobics. Well, a little stretching. A little stretching. <laughs> That's right, get a more limp. Wait a minute, wait I put my ear on so I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear what you're saying. Great. Oh. Back a few okay, is yeah. Salter number one? <laughs> 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 I guess both of them are always during the flight. <laughs> 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 they can work on your stretching, you come back next to you. Well, we'll get you up. Get a more limp. One thing I wanted to know about the saddle quadrant. You don't the answer. Saddle quadrant. Four throttles or, or split throttles? Well, there's four, but uh, without a picture, it's hard to explain. But you can hold all four of them. The yeah. center, center cross pieces, are all, they all come together like this. All right. Well, we're going to continue with our interviews. We've had some great interviews with some of the uh, veterans inside. But I, I, you know, last year when we did this special, we were not, I don't believe we were able to talk with these gentlemen, the pilot, co-pilot, flight crew, and ground crew, who basically make these things happen. And... Uh, when you see this broadcast, it'll be too late again. And I told you last year to make sure you're out here for this weekend. So, again, look at your newspapers, listen to the radio, catch the news, because you don't want to miss it. This is just the early part. They're going to be here. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Here's the, I believe, the pilot. Where do we have the pilot? Right here. Don't go away, Scott. Give me your hand. Just one second here, sir. I want to thank you for your service, first of all. And, uh, Scott, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Illinois. I, I Grew up in Rockford area, and I now live down by Carbondale. Living there a couple of years, so. Okay. Well, you went south, get warm down yeah, there. I took my snowblower. I'm trying not to use it. <laughs> no, all you need down in Carbondale is once in a while a little ice. Uh, little get rid of that ice down there. I'm retired, so I just Mother Nature puts it there. I just wait till she takes it away, and then I. So tell me about these flights. So I do these uh, all year long. Is there a particular time you do these, and how did you get involved? Well, generally May through November, the airplane goes on tour, mm -hmm. different stops every weekend, and uh, we make. Make it available to anybody who wants to buy a seat and ride along and experience a little bit of history. Okay, so now we're going to do this. A little, little commercial for uh, upcoming places. If you see in the newspaper that the B-17 is coming to your town or your area, you want to make sure you check it out because it's, I, I've been aboard. It's a phenomenal experience. It's a great experience for the veterans who today uh, took a wonderful flight. Well, the veterans is, is what warms our heart to see yeah. those guys get out and pay tribute to them. It's an honor for us to operate this and, and let them see it one more time and share their stories with us. And yeah. Well, you hang on here for one second. Is there a co-pilot here? Neil Morrison. Neil Morrison. Neil, let me ask you something. Was there a, was there a gentleman in a Air Force uniform on your flight? The colonel, yes. <coughs> yeah, and, and I imagine he's in his uh, upper 80s or well into his 90s, something like that. But uh, back in 1940 to Two to 45, that was, young man was flying a B-17 like this yeah. in combat missions over Europe. Well, we interviewed him, and this the, uh, reason I, they're all great guys, but that particular gentleman flew in World War II, flew in the Korean War, and also flew training missions in Nam. 
41 years in the Air Force, Army Air Corps to Air Force. So quite, quite an individual, and he's the guy with all the jokes that uh, we'll see in the interviews, and, and I'm sure you probably saw him uh, in flight as well. Yeah, he's a real personality, and it, <laughs> it's a treat to have him on board. And from those guys, we learn little details that aren't in books oftentimes, and, and issues that came up on their missions that they might not have thought it were important, but we find it so important and valuable to find out the nuanced little things about operating a B-17 that uh, you don't get out of the, all the history books. Yeah, and the, and the one thing I, well, several things I learned this year with, with talking to the guys, and I think the word was Tagalier. Tagalier, right. I never heard that term used before, and so we had a little quiz for the for the viewers, and you know what is that? And of course, we had a, a Tagalier mm -hmm. who explained exactly what that definition, what they do, and I'm not going to tell you what that what that is. You have to watch the whole interview to know what that is. Uh, tell the folks a little bit about how this works. Now, the the, the veterans who flew today that was a courtesy flight, uh, but there's opportunities for the public. In the future, here at Lewis uh, Airport, um, Lewis University Airport, but at other stops along the way that the B-17 crew would make, um, what's the process? What what is the cost? What's the investment? And, and how long is the flight? Costs range from 400 to 450 dollars per ride, mm -hmm. per seat. Um, you can find out all about it. B-17.org is probably the quickest, easiest way to get the word out. Okay. So those are the and, dates and schedules? Date schedules. There's a phone number on there. You can call to make a reservation for, for a future flight or get a, they'll give you a number to get a hold of us right here on the ground right. at the tour stop if you want to walk up. And uh, But they've got all the history and all the schedule. It's quite an experience. Now, uh, how does it work with pilot and co-pilot? Who, who takes off, who lands, and who flies the plane? You do it all? Or do, do, who does it? It's pretty. It's a team effort. Um, Neil's actually the aircraft commander. Okay, we'll talk to the aircraft commander. <laughs> he outranks you right now. Okay, <laughs> tell us that, how it works. Well, that's because I've been here longer. Uh, so it, it is very much a two-pilot aircraft. Plus, we have a flight engineer. One of our ground mechanics is also a trained flight engineer on the aircraft. So we go up with three crew members on board. And the duties are very specific. The pilots uh, trade off flying, so it's not always the uh, the old time way. Was oftentimes the left seat, the pilot, the aircraft commander would do all the flying. Very often, you find a co-pilot that says, "Yeah, I, my pilot didn't let me fly." I'll find other pilots that that said, "Oh, as a co-pilot, I was with a captain that had me fly quite a bit." It varies. So, but here we run it more like a uh, structured, like modern day airlines do, where we trade off flights. We every other leg, uh, we trade off the flying. Hit, say another point on the uh, B17.org. Something that is for most everybody is, after we're done flying in the mornings, we're available for ground tours. We open up the airplane, and uh, stem to stern, it's a self-guided, self-paced tour that uh, families can enjoy. Uh, there's a there's a bit of crawling around, but there's uh, it, it's a uh, enjoyable airplane to go through on the ground and see the old uh, radios, the machine guns, the Norden bomb site in the front of the airplane, and the flight uh, deck area, the cockpit area with the uh, massive throttle system that the B-17 has. So we're open for ground tours in the afternoon. Our next stop on this particular tour is down in Cincinnati, Lunkin Field. Hey, what date would that be? Uh, it'd be next weekend, the following weekend, which is, so we're talking uh, the the 6 plus uh, 7, about the 13th, 14th, okay, something great, like that. Great. We've got, you know, I said ground crew, but some of these gentlemen are also pilots, and, and you know, they come ground crew one day and maybe flight crew the next day. Uh, I do know that this gentleman last year uh, was in flight with, when I, when I, took off with the veterans so I'm going to uh, I'm told that you're the ranking officer here among the ground crew <laughs> I hear you know nothing changes in the military there's always somebody back there saying something uh, all right Meredith Whitlock uh, good to have you thank you for your service as well uh, tell me what the uh, uh, you know what are you what are you doing uh, precise uh, some of the stuff you saw when they were taking off and, and, and coming in here um, but exactly what does the ground crew do that the people can see and stuff that they cannot see? Well, we're the uh, mechanics uh, on board the airplane, uh, and we go with the airplane. And when we have passengers on board, we sort of, uh, you can sort of uh, 
compare it to being a flight attendant. We help keep people moving uh, through the airplane, make sure everybody gets a chance to get up and see the th through the nose section of the airplane. And we're also available in case we have any in-flight uh, problems uh, yeah. that we handle, help handle on the airplane. And then, of course, on the ground, we walk around the airplane and we do a pre-flight inspection to make sure everything is uh, ship-shaped, ready to go. And, uh, and then the flight crew gets on board and do, does a systems check to further make sure that we're ready to go every day. And yeah, you do a great job. You talk about a flight attendant, you know, much bigger rank than a flight attendant. But I, I know there was an incident last year, uh, not a real big one, but it was an incident. Somebody a little airsick, and this gentleman just handled it as cool as can be. I mean, I don't think too many people aboard the plane even knew it was happening, except me, because I happened to be looking at the guy <laughs> at the exact time he did his thing. Uh, so I would be the second one you're going to be worked on if we weren't six minutes away from landing. Um, I'm, I'm fine unless somebody does that in front of me. Right, yeah. um, all right, well, introduce some of the fellows to, to the left and right, and who's here on the ground crew? Okay, this is uh, Tim Fox. He's one of the tour coordinators. He's the lead tour coordinator. And then there's Glenn Hill. He's the other crew chief uh, mechanic. And Robert Hunt. He, and... Uh, He's a assistant uh, tour coordinator. Good. All right. What what does uh, now? You're the local guy. Yeah, I live in Elgin area. In Elgin. Well, we call it regional. Yeah, it's regional. You know? regional. It's not real local, but uh, I spend a lot of time in this area. Great, great. Well, you know, let me ask you this: you're the tour guys and the, and, the, and the ground crew, as well as a pilot and co-pilot, um, Lewis University Airport. How many years you've been coming here, and, and and what's your impression of this airport? Well, it's a great airport. I think this might be our fifth year something like that we were due page one year and i think we've been to lewis airport ever since I've, I've been doing this for six years now and i i think we've been here five that I, with i've been here five years right, right. anything uh robert or or, or or tim anyone else anything to add that we're missing here about the tour how do how how are the tour let me just do this how are the tours set up well the tours are set up uh well ahead of time with the local eaa chapters who uh, provide a lot of the ground support, the ground personnel, to handle uh, the crowds and things of that nature. We're the crew that stays with the B-17. Uh, as a tour uh, coordinator, we're kind of like the managers of the tour. Uh, we take care of, of you know, the bills. Uh, we book flights. We deal with the, with the people coming out here and uh, get everything ready for the individual flights. And uh, so as a group, um, we travel with the airplane basically and serve as we get to each of the locations and try to facilitate people coming out seeing this airplane. And that's for us anyway, it's one of the biggest um, things is the reaction that people have to this airplane. We touch people at a, at a basic level that's sometimes surprising. And I think any one of us can tell you stories of interactions with people uh, where they've come up to the airplane and relived their own memories. They've relived the memories of their family. And um, they walk away uh, very much uh, satisfied with circumstances and, and so forth. And for all of us to have an opportunity to do that kind of thing is marvelous. It's a pl uh, both a privilege and a pleasure, I'm sure. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Let me move over here just for a second and talk with uh, Ron here for a moment. Uh, Robert. He, uh, Robert, I'm sorry. Robert, um, one of the things he mentioned was people looking at it and, and, and memories and so forth. How do uh, the veterans who are here today and the veterans that will be here tomorrow as well, uh, how are they contacted? How do, you, how do they know that you're coming in? Well, usually that's probably covered through the local chapters. Uh, when we we come into town we really don't know anything that it's going on and they do all the scheduling and so forth so they go out to their you know the local uh, VFWs and mm -hmm. so forth and and contact these people uh, and bring them out they're all in charge of that great and I and I one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm remiss in saying and, and one of you two on either side of me gonna help me out this event is has a has a name uh, and a title I would imagine and what is it this is the, you mentioned the EAA, is this a local chapter event or is this the B-17 tour? Well, it's a B-17 tour, but it's always in, in conjunction with the lo local chapters. So they, they make arrangements for a lot of the things that go on, but a lot of it is arranged in uh, Oshkosh through EAA. Okay. 
Well, that's the other thing. Someday, every one of you put on your bucket list to get to Oshkosh because it's on my bucket list, and I haven't been there yet. Uh, years ago, I was there, but not in the last 20 years or so. Well, I thank you. This is, the, uh, I believe, the close of our interviews here. It's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to be here with these gentlemen and uh, our great veterans we were able to uh, talk to. So, uh, so long, and we'll see you. Uh, we're going we're gonna to show you some of the planes coming in and out. Uh, right now and then uh, we'll close it off for you. Take care.